But this is pretend cloud, or how to accidentally an open source project. Um, my name's uh, Mike Ruff Ruffman. You know me as Roshi on IRC. Um, I work for Red Hat, specifically on Fedora. I'm on the QA team with uh, Adam Williams and Tim Flink. And I work on Fedora full time, which is awesome. I'm an accidental cloud working group member. Um, Who isn't? The, uh, <laughs> Cloud, when we did the Fedora Next thing, we needed a QA rep with each of the working groups. And I got Cloud. And somehow I ended up on the Cloud working group and actually like helped them make decisions, which I think is hilarious, but it's been working out so well, you know, so far. <laughs> um, some of my dislikes, I dislike bells and whistles. You know, I, I like things simple and I want them to work and I don't usually care about the things that make it shiny. I mean, I typically end up using Mate or i3 as my window manager. You know, I just the bells and whistles don't do it for me. And then also, I really dislike magic. Like things that I don't understand how it works or it seems like magic, I dislike them because I want to know how they work. And my experience with cloud and specifically with test cloud has been that because so much of cloud is, you know, is summed up in the. Uh, I only saw the trailer some movie and the guy's like nobody understands what the cloud is and it's pretty true I mean we hear about it all the time but a true understanding of how to build one and how it works you know isn't typically you know typical knowledge um, so we're gonna go to the intro um, the, the first thing and this is just for the purpose of this talk I got in an argument with somebody on IRC about what cloud was um, but this is just for the purpose of this talk, is, you know, what I needed to do on the QA team was test and validate our images, because for a long time, the amount of testing that was being done on the cloud images sometimes would just be like Dennis Gilmore booting it once in EC2 and saying, okay. And that was, you know, that was the Fedora 22 cloud image, which isn't nearly enough testing to say that, <laughs> hey, you should run your production on a recently released cloud instance. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have never said that Fedora, you should run your, 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 your Well, we try explicitly not cloud. to say that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that was the extent of the testing that we had. And, you know, so for the purposes of this talk, the cloud is literally just some means to boot an instance so that you can SSH into it and make it do stuff. You know, it's, it's none of the glue that allows all of the automagic scaling, you know, or anything like that. This is just booting the raw QCOW or raw image somewhere where you can test it. So, you know, the cloud is collecting lots of user data. That's what, the, <laughs> that's what cloud is in real life. Right. And that's why I say it's almost a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when, when we were you know, cloud really isn't, at a, at a high level conceptually, it isn't that different from what we've been doing for a really long time with VPSs. You know, we started out, and, and this is what, this is how we did mass hosting. You know, we did it, and, and it was a Model T. And now we're to the point where it's, you know, a Tesla. We've gotten really good at provisioning virtual machines and making them useful for us, allowing us to scale up. In the old days, we had a server and uh, hard drives and stuff like that. Locally, well, it's just moved up so it's global. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's adding automation. So you know that's that's how we're going to be looking at cloud today. And I want to go over you know what goes in a cloud image. You know how does it get its information? You know what makes it different from a traditional install. Um, and really, the stuff that goes into a cloud image isn't isn't that different from a traditional install. But the way that they're built is you run an install on a VM and then you take a snapshot of that virtual machine and duplicate it for all of your instances. Um, so like you can actually build your own custom cloud images just with Vert Manager, you know, and you can run your snapshots and whatnot. And we'll get into some of the intricacies of how a cloud instance is a little bit different than a normal install, 
but that's basically how they're built. It's just a snapshot of an already installed machine. Um, so you'll have all of your, well, I, I recently learned you don't actually have all of the normal packages that you're used to. Um, but whatever is installed in a, in a typical you know, base Fedora install is usually going to show up in your cloud images. Um, there's been some transition to move like the uh, breaking the kernel package into kernel core and then the kernel like extras was to bring the kernel package size down because like cloud doesn't need hardware drivers. Like cloud doesn't need a lot of the stuff that you know ships with your kernel you know for every install. Um, but one of the, the, the key things that makes a cloud image useful is cloud init with and cloud init is a a software tool for pulling in like identity information about that instance. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not really that different from a normal install. You SSH into a cloud instance and you're gonna have most of the tools that you're used to at, a com at the command line that you have on a normal install or a, or a uh, bare metal machine. So this brings us to metadata. Um, when you do a normal install on bare metal, you know, you give the machine a host name you know, it pulls its IP from DHCP. You, you tell it what users and what the passwords are gonna be on that. But a cloud instance has no way of, of knowing any of that. So your metadata is all of the identity information, you know. So you've got an instance that's basically just a blob and then it has to ping some kind of service. And this can be like on uh, Amazon, it's at IP 169.254, 169.254, and this will pull all of your instance data to that instance. And then, you know, we'll give you your SSH keys, um, also any user data scripts that you say, hey, the first time I provision this instance, I want you to create these users, install these packages, configure these services, and, you know, that's what really allows cloud to be able to scale up and out is, is the metadata service. Um, so, but you can get it, you know, each cloud provider hosts it a slightly different way. Um, but cloud init, you know, can do network resources. Um, the way that we use it in test cloud is you can actually do a local disk, a local file system. So we end up creating an ISO with the metadata in it and then attaching it. And then cloud init is smart enough to look, you know, to, to go through its sources and pick out the one that's actually available. And I'm not. There, do you know the order of precedence on that? Because it's network. I haven't. I haven't memorized it. It's in the source code somewhere. Okay. Well, yeah. it's always in the source code somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't recall. Um. But yeah, and cloud init, you know, doesn't only just give instance information. Um, you can in install packages. Um, you can do pretty much anything. Any. You can run any bash script. You can feed it a bash script and have it have it run through but it also has some, some useful directives so that you don't have to do everything in bash, um, you know, which makes it so that your cloud init scripts, if you've been installing certain packages on all your instances and you want to try it on, you know, let's say, uh, you know, a Debian-based instance, your cloud init script will, will transfer pretty easily to a, new, to a new distro, which is one of the nice things about cloud init. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, Ansible is much the same way. And, and like, a lot of what you can do with Ansible, you can do with Cloud Init and vice versa. Yeah. You know, so, like, I've run into a couple times where Cloud Init, like, the package was failing, but I still needed to configure my instances. And so I was able to do that through Ansible. Gotcha. Um, so, how does Test Cloud fit in? Well, Test Cloud is the homebrewed electric moped of clouds, you know compared to you know the Model T and the Tesla there. This is test cloud. <laughs> it handles the giving you your metadata and instantiating your cloud instance locally on your machine. It runs off of uh, Humu Libvirt and it just makes it a whole lot easier. Because one of the problems that I ran into as a new QA guy is I had access to a couple OpenStack instances that were often running out of storage 
or you know there was some other issue with it, and I didn't want uh, I didn't want to use EC2 because I didn't want to charge Fedora, the Fedora project money just for me testing if I could do it somewhere else. Um, and so what I I had been doing is I looked up um, some documentation and tutorials on how to how to just boot a cloud image in Vert, Vert Manager, and it was a royal pain. It was like 12 steps that I had to run each time I wanted to boot a new instance. Yeah, so cloud image like passwords, for example. Yeah. So I was spending I was spending 10 to 15 minutes each test just getting it set up and ran, and I was like, well, this is a waste. So I started scripting it out, and it was originally just a an easy, it was a dirty Python hack to do it all automatically for me. That way I didn't have to. Um, but it requires vert install, QMU, libvert, um, and then also it can, by default, uh, spin up vert viewer so that you can get a GUI. You don't have to use SSH if you don't want to. Um, and it's recently been ported to uh, integrate with libvert. So now when you start an instance in test cloud, it'll show up in virtual machine manager and you can manage all of your machines like that, um, which has proven to be a whole lot easier because when you're just doing raw QMU commands, it's really easy to lose instances and leave them running for days on end and not even know that you have them running because you weren't paying attention. Oh yeah, a QMU instance is almost a whole terminal full of of text. It's and, and that was the other thing I was doing by hand each time. Yeah. Like it got really old really fast. And it, and using like Val, they said, you know, the QMU instance uh, interface changes constantly and use Libvert instead. Yeah, exactly. Well and, you know, we just recently did the porting for that and it's it's become a whole lot easier to use. Um, but the potential uses for test cloud, you know, initially I was just using it for testing. And it was one of those things where I had a niche and I scratched it. And it never occurred to me that anybody else would ever want to use this because it was just a dirty Python hack by a non-cloud guy. Like, you know, I was taking information from tutorials and just jamming it into a Python script. But it turns out that other people also had the same itch. There's one person who's got the issue. A lot of people have the issue. It's... It's true. When I uh, I told a, a friend of mine that I that other people were using my code, he just laughed at me and said, "Haha, now you have an open source project." <laughs> He's like, "Welcome to the club." That's how it works. <laughs> so, but the other thing I've been using the test cloud for, and other people have used test cloud for, is setting up dev instances. Like, you know, um, for instance, I'm able to to test software stacks and whatnot on a cloud, you know, while on the plane when I'm not willing to pay for, you know, the four hundred dollar a minute wireless access. Um, also automation. Um, did any of you guys go to Tenier's, the talk on Tenier? Okay, well Tenier is uh, a small continuous integration uh, application that they're, that Crucial DOS is trying to use for, for testing cloud images and it actually uses test cloud as its engine to boot its instances and SSH in and run the tests and then the a uh, larger project that Tenir is going to be integrated into is called Taskatron. Has anybody heard of Taskatron? Yeah. Okay, well Taskatron, like right now what we're working on is disposable clients. Because right now Taskatron can run tasks, like any kind of generic task, but one of the things we really want to be able to do is run destructive tests. But currently the way it's set up, you can't run a destructive test because then it, you know, kills, it kills the slave. But now we have, with the disposable clients work that we're doing, <coughs> um, where you're going to be able to spin up an instance and run the destructive test and report the results all in a safe, in a safe manner. And, and test cloud is is the engine that's being used to do that. Um, and then I have reports in the wild of somebody at their day job using test cloud to deploy their production services on their internal network, which I do not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> it says in the name. At all. I do not recommend this at all. But those those servers have been up for, I think, 11 months now. And they're working fine because really all Test Cloud does is it handles handles the prepackaging and then it passes it off to Libvirt. You know, so 
it's, I guess you could do it, but you know, you have it from me, the author, don't use this as a deployment tool. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I was asked recently if I had any plans to make Test Cloud its own proper, like, small cloud service, and I don't. <laughs> that's, that's an order of magnitude higher than, you know, somebody looked at it and they're like, wow, you're like a, a web UI away from an OpenStack cloud. Yeah, probably work better. <laughs> well, and, and that was one of, the, one of the things I was looking at is I didn't have, when I started out testing cloud images, I didn't have hardware to run an OpenStack instance of any like size, but then also getting it to work was a non-trivial task. And I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to have to maintain this day in and day out just so that I can, you know, make sure that I can install packages and, and test services on our cloud images. Um, but yeah, now it's it's demo time. Uh -oh. oh, don't worry, it's recorded. I know, right? So what what this is going to do um, is I, I recorded output with uh, script. Has everybody heard of script? It's awesome. I can't believe I didn't know about it before because I've done live demos before, and that was a really bad idea. Um, How's it spelled? Script. Just like right yeah, it's just it's just script that's installed on oh. on your machine already. It's a it's a really old tool. I guess it used to. I guess it used to be used for turning in homework. Like you, you turned in a timing file and the output, and I was like, man, I would, I would have, I would have preferred that way to turn in homework. <laughs> um, but it's going to install Test Cloud, which is currently the only build is in is in Covert right now. It's still pending package review to actually get into the Fedora repositories. But it's going to install it from Covert, and then it's going to download an image, uh, a cloud image, and then boot it up and just run through some, some basic tests. But this will give you a feel for, for what it does and I'll explain where it's saving information and how it's getting it because the in my first iteration of Test Cloud, every time it ran a test it downloaded a fresh image, but now, now it'll download the image once and cache it and then use that image as a backing store. So each of your instances is fresh but it also doesn't eat up all your hard drive space. Um, so you can have, is everybody familiar with backing stores, like Q, or, uh, QCow, two backing stores? I've seen the feature, I haven't used it. Well, oh, it's, it's really nice because it, now for Test Cloud, the instant storage is just the delta between its backing store and what I've installed. Oh, so it's like, it's like a snapshot that stores separately. Exactly. You know, and, and you can run that over a network. You can, you can use backing stores from a lot of different places. Oh. Yeah. No, you can. Uh, it's a. It's a command like GUI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kept all my type. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I wanted you to you know that this actually happened. I didn't just, you know, fabricate all of this. Yes, you did. <laughs> but it's in Copa. It's going to install um, libguestfs. Uh, Preferred install, preferred manager. Um, initially, the way that the only way that I could get it to work with QMU was I had to extract the kernel initial RAM disk. That way, I could modify boot args before it booted. But now this handles all of that comfortably. And I guess next time I should do this on an 800 by 600 screen. That way, it doesn't look that bad. Just like it's like when I saw it, like uh, you know, with guess it was like why are you modifying the image? Is there an ability to test case? <laughs> Yeah, and then it, all, all it did is, is extract the kernel. Right, and you don't do that anymore. So yeah. Do yeah, it doesn't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the CLI interface is, you know, test cloud instance and then create, stop, or destroy. You know, so you can create one and then you give it, you give it a uh, name <coughs> and a URL and it'll go and fetch that image and it can do local storage or, you know, from Koji. Um, and I ran it, like, I've learned a lot about libvert with this entire process. Um, libvert's really hard to silence. You know, I have explicit warnings in there. It says, don't worry about these QMU driver errors. Libvert is whiny and there's no method to <laughs> shut it up. Like, you know, so basically I just have to keep pounding libvert until it gives me the domain name that I know that it has. Um, but then it'll, it'll return.
return the IP address of your recently spawned instance, which is one of the things that has been a pain. If you launch something <coughs> in Libvirt, there's no easy way to tell what the IP address. I mean, it's an Uber guest agent, but it's, it's, it's like there's an Uber framework and all. Yeah, and it's you, you have to add a lot of stuff and do so a lot of monkeying around. So, how did, how did so. so my solution is I dump the XML of the guest you just created. I find the MAC address. I do ARP A, and I search for it, and then I spit it back. Been there, done that. Like, and you know, it works. I haven't had any failures on that particular piece. And then, so the way Test Cloud works is, I, know, I lost the home piece. Um, can everybody see that? Fine. Okay, so Test Cloud has cache in instances, which I'm apparently I need to rename cache because I guess that's caused some confusion in the past. This is going to be packing stores or something similar. Um, yeah, something. I just I was using cache as a generic term, which I guess caused some some uh, frustration. Just to clarify, you know, you know about the, 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 what the file system hierarchy standard is, you know, data that's temporary, or data that's permanent, that can be deleted, can be here and all? Yeah. Okay. So if I do test cloud instance list, it will look through and find me all of my running instances. Um, and then I can pass call, and it'll tell me all the ones that stop, that are shut off. Uh, so if I do you really got to do tab completion for this and now inside the instances there's a, a directory for each instance so if I go to my cloud So IP address is just a flat text file with the IP address that it that it found earlier, um, because I have created instances and then gone away and come back and not been able to find <laughs> the IP address of the instance that I created. So I started saving it in a file. Um, but the if we look at the metadata. Is it an instance ID and a local host name? So, like, you can go in here and change this for each of your instances, and it's all in a, a Python config object. Um, but it defaults to test cloud, and it defaults to uh, to a, a password of password, um, and it allows SSH password authentication because the default on cloud instances is to only accept SSH keys. Which you can also use Test Cloud to inject SSH keys. Um, this was just easier for me and has stayed there for the past good year. It's for your replication, what you need to do, just put it up and leave it down. Yeah. Exactly. And it's all local behind a firewall. But, you know, anything that you like, the, I tried to meddle with as little as possible. So anything that you can do in CloudNet, you can still do with Test Cloud. You know, you can feed it custom user scripts and metadata information. Um, and then still have some API work or some CLI interface stuff to work on to make it easier to do. Right now you'd have to manually edit the configuration object. Um, so if we do... I'd like to point out that there's a bunch of rules about uh, like stack exchange answers for uh, what's the default password on the Fedora cloud. Yes. yes. Okay. And they apply to like Fedora 19. my 
SSH key, password. You know, now we have a uh, a running cloud image locally, um, which isn't isn't much, but it saves you a lot of extra time getting all of the everything configured, and it's going to be it's got rel what I think are relatively same defaults. So whenever you spin up a new instance, you know it's going to be the same user, the same password. You know, unless you configure it different. And right now, this is only tested on Fedora images. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't also boot Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, CoreOS, you know, whatever type of QCow you can throw at it. But that hasn't been tested yet. And that's something that we plan on doing in the future so that you can pick out, you know, you can test multiple images with it, which will be especially useful for anybody else that's using it, like in Taskatron, you know, if you want to test that your package builds and also installs on CentOS, you know, we can do that in a disposable client. So you can also do image list, which will tell you all of the images that you have downloaded, um, which is nice, you know, on my desktop back at the house, there's like 40 of them. And right now, it's just the file name of whatever gets spit out of code here is uh, put on download.fb.o. Um, but it also makes it really easy if you're if you want to reuse an instance. All you need is that name that you pass it as the URL, and it, it will look and say, "Oh, I already have that," and then use it. You're good to go. So yeah, any questions? Yeah, initially I had this different arguments and commands that had to be passed into QMU and port redirection and whatnot to allow VNC and and Spice viewers to connect to yeah. to those guests. And I haven't removed those flags out of the code yet. Um, but right now it it runs in Vert Manager, so you can change all of the you can twiddle those settings as much as you want, you know, for however you want to view it. Yeah, I think that that's a nice use. Yeah, well, now, now that Libvert's handling all of that, I mean, I think it's automatic. I mean, I can see it, and I need to, like, you know, use, use test cloud, get the cloud out, and like, no, install your desktop environments. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's that's kind of the plan, because, you know, with uh, with Taskatron and disposable clients, we want to make test cloud capable of also running desktop environment. So like, you know, for GNOME, they have like a GNOME test suite that's, you know, relatively, uh, you know, runs through a bunch of stuff, but we could spin that up and actually run the GNOME tests on a fresh install in a VM before we sign off on that build. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. I'm the person who does the uh, rescans. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to do some more quick testing other than it. It boots. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, you know, I'm working on right now porting a bunch of the CentOS tests to work on Fedora and going to run them via via test cloud. You know, that way we can increase our our test coverage overall. But that'll fit right into Taskatron. And Taskatron, you know, when there's you can write generic tasks with disposable clients, so you should be able to set that up as a task anytime a respin happens. Well. Uh, or I set it up to do some tests, boot the lab image into the test yeah. lab and let it do it that way. And oh yeah, no, it, exactly. Uh, your, you need to test your lab images as well, so yep. it, I think down the road it's going to solve both our problems. Yeah, well that, that was the hope. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really learned a lot about what is okay for me have on a, a quick dirty hack that only I use and how next time I think somebody might find something useful I should try to you know design it right the first time because going back and refactoring is not much fun. But yeah so that's that's test cloud and you know we're going to be able to use it to you know so people want to try the cloud image say hey 
install test cloud, feed it this URL, and now you can poke around at a cloud image. You know, you don't have to have OpenStack running somewhere. You don't have to have EC2. You don't have to figure out the esoteric chicken sacrifice practices that you have <laughs> to get it to run in libvirt. And you said you don't like magic, but you didn't even say this other magic. <laughs> well, I tried to explain it to you, so it's not magic anymore. <laughs> But yeah, the, the source code is all, I mean, it's not it's not a very big project. It's uh, some wrapper commands and utility functions to handle extra data, but it's, it's really easy. Patch is welcome. We've got a, I need to come up with a roadmap on what all we're actually gonna work, work on. But there's, we have a list of things that need done if, if anybody's interested in uh, helping us out on it. Yeah, Adam is working on that right now, actually. He's got some some packages to finish. Yeah. If you just Google test pilot, you'll see this like, uh, company test pilot. Yeah. Yeah.